<laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Um, well, I guess I, I want all of you to be successful, and I think that's probably why I'm here. And I have a passion for making students do well, I guess, in life after college. And so what I've got, I've got some handouts, and I hope you, there are enough for everyone. Uh, let's look at the one, the one side that says dollars and donuts, financial topics. Look at that first. So she's got some copies back there. Um, if you don't have one, just look on with somebody next to you. First topic I want to talk about was student loans. And uh, well, first of all, if you don't mind me asking, I'm sure that most of you all have student loans, so it's not embarrassing. How many of you have student loans? Just raise your hand. OK. So here's what I recommend on student loans. Let's just start, start right with that. And because that's the most, maybe the most pressing issue you're going to have when you, when you uh, get out of, when you're out of college. Some of you are going to go on to grad school. And I know this is going to be different for those of you to go to grad school. But if you have a job right after uh, this, then student loans should be a high priority in your life to get those paid off and to consolidate those student loans to a lower interest rate. If your interest rates say seven, eight percent, you could consolidate those loans and get maybe a three or four percent. I, I know I could get a three or four percent interest rate on, on loans right now. So you could easily get a three or four percent instead of a seven or eight percent. So consolidating the loans, getting those paid off as quickly as possible, putting a high priority on that. Um, we can go back and I can answer questions on that at the end. Uh, well, if you have questions during my talk here, we can also do that. I can cover that. So if it comes to mind, please ask. Just raise your hand and I can answer your question. Other debt, um, that would be like your auto debt and any kind of other debt you might have. I'm not sure what uh, type of debt you might have, but that's probably your typical debt would be your auto loans and student loans and things like that. So as far as auto loans go, um, it's really, really important to get started saving early. So, you know, getting those auto loans paid off, if you have one, is really critical. Um, one, one piece of advice I might have is buy a used car and try to do it with cash. If you can't do that, then, um, and if you really don't want to work on it, you know, you don't worry about it breaking down on you. If you're driving in places where it would be very critical to have a well, op you know, good operating vehicle, then you might consider, at least for the short term, maybe a, a very a, a really low lease rate on a on a on a small car, and you can get something for you know between 100 and 170 dollars a month, um, and that might get you through while you're trying to pay off your debt, keep your costs low, and then make your maintenance costs zero on that vehicle. That would be uh, something that I would re maybe think about, either paying cash for a car or getting a very very low lease price. And don't, you know, you can go into a car dealer and pay $200, $300 for a, you know, on a lease and you get talked into it. What I do when I lease a car is I simply go to the Detroit paper. I see all the best deals in there. I call the dealership and say, okay, you know, yeah, it says it's uh, maybe advertised for $140 a month. Um, ask for the details and I get everything ironed out before I even go to the dealership. That way I don't have to be pulled into their sales techniques. Get it all wor worked out, do it over on the internet, whatever. But um, that, that might be a second best option other than paying cash for a car. So keep your car debt either zero or keep your lease payments under $150. That's what I recommend. Um, your first house, let's talk about that. Your first house as you leave college, you're not gonna wanna buy a house right away. And let me tell you why. Um, I, did, I waited several years before I bought a house because I wanted to make sure that I was going to stay in the job that I was, that, where I'm going to be locating. So I moved to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I did buy a house. I think after the third year I was with the, in, you know, in that particular job. Um, but I wanted to wait at least a few years to make sure I was going to stay in the job and that they like me enough to keep me, and I like them enough to stay there, and maybe met a girl met a guy, you know, decided to, to live there, you know, get married, whatever. Um, so you, you decide that you want to live in that city and then you start looking. And then when you start looking, of course, you're going to want to keep your, you know, housing costs very low because, you know, you're just starting out lower income and you want to have a house that that's not more than um, double your annual income. So if your annual income is uh, $60,000 a year, 
you'd want to go no more than 120,000. That's a general rule. So um, then you also want to think about if you're married, then if your spouse makes another 60, so you're at 120,000 here, let's say, you want to think about if you're going to have children and, and say the wife is going to stay at home, then the husband's the only one working, then you want to buy a house that's going to fit the budget of just the one working spouse, okay? So you want to double that 60,000, no more than 120,000, even if you're now making 120,000 with the spouse's income, okay? Because once you move down to that lower level of income, that, you know, that more expensive home is going to, is going to be a killer. So where, you know, where do you buy a house? I'll just real briefly go into that. You want to look at school districts. That's really important. Um, you want to look at a vibrant area that's growing in terms of, you know, the housing prices are growing. Uh, you want to look at an area where the turnover on the homes is, you know, like 60 days or less, 60 to 90 days or less, so that they're selling within 60 to 90 days. And that's been the trend for the last, you know, five or more years. Um, moving on to credit score. I know I don't have a lot of time, so I'm kind of moving quickly through these, and I apologize for that. If I had an hour, I'd be spending more time with these. But the credit score, I think, is an important thing to think about. The average credit score for a college student graduating is 660 right now. And that, I'm, I'm sorry, I take that back. It's uh, the average credit score for a person 25 to 34 is 660. And the average credit score goes up as the age goes up. So in my age bracket, the average credit score is something like 720 or something like that. So the bad news is that you guys, your age group has a very low credit score because 720 is sort of the entry level for getting low interest rates and having some good things happen in terms of jobs. When, when they search, when you apply for a job and they check your credit score and it's only 660, that may not be good news. When you apply for um, car insurance or life insurance or whatever, some car insurance in particular, and they check your credit score and it's 660, that's not so good. Your premiums are going to be higher. When you go to get a loan, a mortgage or a car loan or a lease or anything, you know, your credit score is 660. That's not good news, okay? Because your lease payments, your interest rates, everything goes up when your credit score is down. 720 and above, you got to shoot for that. Um, and I would recommend the uh, website that, I, or I mean the app uh, that, that I recommend. A lot of people don't like this app, but I don't, I've never had any trouble with it. Um, it's called Credit Karma with a K, Karma with a K. Uh, now that one has free credit scores and you can go in and, and get that, um, look at it every month and see it changing. And then that way you keep track of it and do the right things. Go online and see what you have to do in order to keep increasing that credit score. Shoot for 720 and above. Mine is, I'm just going to come around and tell you, mine is 830, you know? And why is it 830? Well, back when I first started really monitoring my credit, it was like high 700s, which is still really good. But I just kept hitting it hard, you know, looking at all the different things they look at. And I'm working on those individual items. And eventually it went from like 760 up to 830. And you guys can do the same thing. You can go from 660, if that's where you're at, up to 720 or higher. So my recommendation is get it above 800 if you can. But if 750 is all you can do, that's good because that's excellent and you're going to get the lowest interest rates. Now on saving for retirement, this is probably the most critical thing I'm going to talk to you about. I really want you to do well. Now, um, and the only way you're going to do well is start early. You've got to start re saving early. You've got to get your money into a, and you're going to take a little more risk when you're young. That's okay, because you have your whole life to recover from that risk. I don't have my whole life to recover from risk, but you do. So what I'm saying is that, you know, if, you, if you're thinking about putting money into a savings account or a CD or something like that, that's probably a huge mistake because uh, you're going to get a very low interest rate and you're not even going to cover inflation. So you're actually going to lose money every year. The only way that you're going to stay ahead of inflation is if you go into, well, stocks and some bonds, uh, not bonds I don't necessarily recommend, real estate investment trusts, things like that. Um, when you get your first job, you'll have an opportunity to start saving right away. Your biggest mistake would be if you didn't start putting money into your retirement account immediately. Let's say your employer says, I'm going to do a 2% match for every 2% you put in, well, I'm going to put in 2%. Now, if you think about this for a moment, if you put in 2%, they put in 2%, what kind of a return is that on your money? Anybody know? 
it's 100%, 100% return. Now, if you can get 1% return on a CD, would you, how, why would you pass up 100% return on your money? Why would you do that? It would be insane, wouldn't it? So, so you, if you get a match like that, you want to go to the maximum level of that match because you're getting 100% return. You're never going to get that kind of return anywhere else in the, you know, in, on your investments. So you want to do that match, you want to do the maximum, and you want to put in more if at all possible. My recommendation is minimum of 10%. All my life I put in 20% of my income, 20%. Now, you might say, oh my gosh, that's a lot of money, but let me tell you, it's worth it. Because in the long run, what happens when you retire, um, you're going to do a lot better in retirement. And you can also, as you're moving along in life, you can do better um, in, in just in all kinds of different ways. So I'm going to explain that in a moment. But um, living in retirement, I know that is something you're not even thinking about yet, but you should be thinking about it because by putting away 10% or even 5%, it doesn't have to be 10%, anything, by putting away anything, your living in retirement will be much better for you. It'll be much easier for you. There are a lot of people my age right now that are going to have to work till they're 75 and even longer just, just to pay the bills. Why? Because they didn't think about this when they were your age. So you've got to start thinking about it now. Don't wait one year. Don't wait two years. Don't wait three years. If you do, it will hurt you um, enormously. So you've got to start immediately. As soon as you get that first job, they say, I'm going to match you on your retirement. You do it. You immediately do it. And you cut back on your other expenses because it will be worth it. But you've got to make that sacrifice right up front. You've got to do it. If you don't do it, you'll never do it. Or you might do it when you're 35. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I will. I will do that right now. Um, so your student loan is say the average student loan right now well let's let's go through some of the questions and that way I can give give you an answer and then I do want to talk about giving back because that's important part of my talk too the um, if you look on the back side um, of your thing there you've got some questions upon graduation what's the average student loan debt does anybody know what your average is for your age group is graduating right now anybody know quite just throw out a number what do you think? 40, 40, it's thirty thousand one hundred. All right, so thirty thousand one hundred dollars. You're you're a little high, but I mean you're close, you know. Um, so it depends on whether it's a state school, private school, that kind of thing. So it's going to be different for every school, obviously. Uh, Spring Arbor happens to be lower than most schools, actually. So thirty thousand one hundred. If you've got to, you've got to pay that off, obviously. Now. Some financial advisors say pay off all your debt first and then start saving for retirement. I don't feel that way at all. I feel like you've got to put some dollars in that retirement immediately. And you've got to, you've got to you know, of course you're going to have to cut back in other areas, but you need to do both. You need to pay that debt down and put money into retirement. So if the employer says we're going to do a 2% match, you put in your 2%, which isn't very much, right? And they put in their 2%, you got 4% going in at the beginning, at least. Then, on top of that, you're paying off that $30,100 loan. You're hitting it hard. You're not just making the minimum monthly payment. You're trying to pay that thing off in two years, okay? So you're trying to pay that thing off in two years. Maybe it'll take you three, but you're trying to do two years, if you can. You're going to live on peanut butter and chili, jelly sandwiches and macaroni cheese and whatever um, for a while. But then you're going you're gonna to feel that it, just that wonderful feeling of having that paid off. I can't tell you how good it felt when I paid my house off, for example. It, it, I have no debt. And I, I can't tell you how good it feels to be debt free. It just feels wonderful. I'm not, uh, you know, don't have to worry about anyone, you know, knocking on my door and saying, you know, I'm going to take your house away or I'm going to take your car away or whatever. Um, okay, so let me kind of do that one last thing and then we're going to go back to these questions. Um, giving back. Why is that the last thing on the list? It should be the first thing probably, right? God comes first in your life, not last. But I wanted to talk about it last because I like to end on the best part as opposed to starting so you don't forget it. So why is giving back part of my talk today? Because by the time, if you follow my advice and you do what I just told you to do with your retirement, 
you're going to have an awful lot of money when you retire. You, some of you will have as much as $20 million in your retirement account. Some of you will have $5 million. Some will have $10 million. It's going to be somewhere between $5 million and $25 million, somewhere in that range. I don't know exactly, but if you follow my advice, you're going to have an enormous amount of wealth. And that wealth is not to be, you know, kept. That wealth is to be shared. Um, and that's what we're supposed to do as Christians. We're supposed to share that wealth. And that's one of the reasons you want to do this, because you want to be able to share your wealth. How many times have you noticed a need or heard about a need and said, I can't do anything about it because I don't have any money, you know? And wouldn't it be nice to see someone who's really in need and you know they're in need and you know they need money, but you can't do a thing about it. But wouldn't it be nice that you could do something about it? You could actually anonymously throw $10,000 at them to help them with their medical bills or whatever other problems they had. On an individual basis, you could do that. You could do that anonymously, and no one would ever know except you and, you know, you and God that you did it. But the thing is, you can't do it if you don't save, if you don't put money towards retirement, put money towards savings. So that, that's my advice to you is think about what the bigger purpose is in life, not just do I get my Mercedes or do I get my 4,000 square foot home, which you probably will, if you follow my advice, at some point in your life, but maybe not until you're 40, you know. Don't go for that 4,000 square foot home when you're 25 because that's not going to get you where you want to be. If you can afford it when you're 40 or 35 or 40 or whatever, that's fine. You can get a bigger home and a nicer car. That's fine. But for the first few years, at least 10 years, you're going to need to make some sacrifices like I did. And then it's going to pay off later. And then you can give back and then you can have a comfortable retirement and then you can have a family that's not trying to you know um, live paycheck to paycheck right what, what is the number one reason for divorce among all Americans what's the number one reason huh financial financial 70 percent of people that are getting a divorce say that finance is their number one reason for the divorce so what I'm telling you is going to save your marriage. It's not just going to help you give back and, 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 you know, and do well in retirement, but it's going to save your marriage. Why? Because arguments are always going to happen in a marriage, and arguments are normally centered around money. Okay? Honey, why didn't, and I've heard this, you know, before I started doing the right thing, uh, I heard this from my own wife, you know, hey, honey, why don't you give me more money? You know, why don't I get more money for clothes? Why don't I get more money for the, you know, and, and I, but I had to change. I had to do something to turn my kind of financial life around. And when I did that, then things were just so much better. And our marriage is wonderful now, although it was fine before. Um, so upon graduation, what is, okay, I already mentioned that. What is the average credit score? I already mentioned that. What did I say it was? 660, and what did, you, what did I say you need to shoot for? At least 720, that's a minimum. I want, you to, I want you to shoot for 830 like mine, but if you can only get 720, that's okay. How much should you save when you get your first job? How much? What did I say? 10%, but if you have to go down to two plus four or whatever that matches to pay off your student loans within two years, you can do that. Um, how much do I save? 20%. All right. Um, if you make $50,000 a year and never get a raise, how much will you have when you're 65? Assume a 10%. Now, what, I'm assuming a 10% return on my money because the stock market has averaged over 10% for the last 90 years. So why wouldn't I want to average or assume 10%? You've got 43 years to retire. You're 20 22 years old, you, you're going to retire when you're 65, 43 years, 7% savings match or savings rate and a 3% employer match. So you're putting in 10% total, right? Seven from you and three for the employer. How much money would you have at the end of... Um, now, remember, you're going to get increases in your wages. And when you retire, you're going to start out at 50 maybe, but you're going to be making 200 at least when you retire because of inflation, 150 to 200 not only that, but you're going to be getting promotions. So you might be making 300000 
and that'll be when a loaf of bread costs six dollars, you know. But still, you're going to be, nah, I'm just kidding, maybe it's only three dollars. But you, you might be making three hundred thousand dollars a year. How much money will you have if you did that? Uh, I'll just tell you, it's three million dollars, approximately three million dollars. All right, so if you put in 10 percent and 50,000, now if you put, if you made a hundred thousand, of course that would be six million dollars. Okay, now let's assume, now let's assume the same scenario, 43 years, 10% of your money goes in of that 50,000 or 5,000 a year goes into the retirement. You got 10% rate of return, but now you get a 12% rate of return with the same numbers. The other numbers are the same. What does that go to from 3 million to what? Just with a 2% increase in your interest rate. What does that number go to from 3 million to what? Anybody want to guess? Yes? Nope. You're low. Anybody want to go higher? Five million. Five million. You're low. I'll just tell you, it's $5.4 million. A 2% interest rate increase uh, over the next 43 years, 12% interest rate gives you $5.4 million. Almost doubled it, right? I mean, not quite, but... Okay, now, the, other, the last question. How much will you have in 43 years if you give up one Starbucks drink for four dollars, does anybody ever pay four dollars for a Starbucks drink? Have you ever? Okay, okay, okay. Anybody ever go to Starbucks and pay four dollars for a drink? Raise your hand if you have, because I have. Okay, all right, most of you. All right, so let's say you gave that up. Let's say you do that every day. You got a really bad habit of going to Starbucks every day and spending four dollars. Okay, now. Um, you know, instead you use a K cup, you know, and it costs you, what, 50 cents? But anyway, you give up that $4 Starbucks and um, in the same assumptions as above, but instead of putting the money in at the end of every year, you would put it in every day. So um, we, we uh, accrue interest daily, in other words. So we put it in the stock market, we put it in at 12%. Uh, $4 a day for 43 years. Anybody know what that Starbucks coffee is going to be worth by the time we retire? What's that Starbucks coffee going to be worth? Tell me. Anybody? 100000 Who wants to guess? 500000 $400,000. Anybody else? Over here. How much? Over here. How much? Just how much? 50000 you guys are not going to believe me when I tell you this. That Starbucks is $2.1 million. Yep. Daily compounding at 12% interest per year, $4 a day, 43 years, $2.1 million. That was almost as, I, I figured about $3 million on, the, on your retirement account. That's like two thirds of your retirement money. The Starbucks every day. Can you believe that? So how do I get 20, how do I save 20% of my pay? I give up a lot of Starbucks. I give up a few other things too besides Starbucks, but going from 10% to 20% of your pay is, you know, that's a big jump, but you can give up a lot of stuff and that's what happens. 2.1 million for the Starbucks. So if you want to do like a dollar a day, let's say you gave up a Coke a day and you paid a dollar for that, that would be about 500, a little over $500,000 that you would have at retirement, that you wouldn't have at retirement if you bought that instead, okay? So, I mean, so I'll take any questions. Uh, if that people have to leave, go ahead. And, you know, I'm, I'm here to answer any question you want. Maybe I explained everything, I don't know. Maybe I explained life to you. I don't know. Yes. Um, if you really, if you really do the credit karma thing and you go in and you look at what they're what they're doing to to uh, actually um, to come up with that number, and you focus on each one of those things and you try to change those things, you can do it in a few months. You can, you can start to raise that to at least six, uh, 680 or 690, probably within just hitting the low hanging fruit. Um, you could do that probably within just a few months. Maybe even one month, you're gonna maybe get a 10 point score. Maybe two months, you get another 10. And 
before you know it, you'll be up to 700. I mean, even a year, probably a year, you'd be up to 700 at, at, at the most. You might, six months maybe. Qu yes? Yeah. Yeah, still save for retirement. You got it. You 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 really should do a Roth IRA and do it through I I believe Vanguard is really the best place to do it. vanguard.com and do a Roth IRA. Start out doing that immediately. In fact, do that anyway. Even if you have a full-time job making 60,000 a year, you should still be doing a Roth IRA for, you know, maybe $2,000 a year minimum. So Roth IRA, 2000 minimum, Vanguard.com, Vanguard.com. Choose, uh, choose the total stock market fund, the total stock market fund. That's probably the best one because it gives you a, a lot of different types of stocks. Total stock market fund, Vanguard.com. I don't make any commission on this, believe me. Uh, yeah. Yes, but uh, you probably can't avoid that, to be perfectly honest, because just about every company is unethical. So the only way you can avoid that is there are some mutual funds that are Christian mutual funds that have higher fees, but it might be worth paying the higher fee to get the ethical you know, companies. Now, are they ethical in every way? No. Will you ever find a mutual fund that has no companies that are, you know, uh, have, has, has no unethical companies? No. But can you reduce the amount of ethic, you know, ethical problems that occur within your investments? Yes, by doing that. But I, you know, a Christian mutual fund company is a, is a good way to do that, if that's something that... And, and I, I haven't done that, I'll be perfectly honest. I probably should, but I haven't. I've used Vanguard. Uh, Vanguard, I, I really feel like Vanguard's a really ethical company in general. And so I go with them because I feel like they have proven themselves over the years. They haven't done any of the unethical things that the other companies like Fidelity and some of the others have done. So, yeah. Good question. That's a very good question. Other questions? Yeah, over if you're in stock, like the total stock market fund in Vanguard, for example, you're probably looking at over the next 43 years, you'd be looking at about a 10% return every year. Now you're going to get eight, you know, two percent one year, and you're going to get twenty percent another year, and the next year, and you're going to get a minus five percent the next year, and you're going to get a plus twenty-five percent, and a plus, you know, it's going to average out to ten. And you have to, you just have to ride with it. You can't worry about those drops, and you know, just ride it out, and don't look at it too much because if you do, you're going to get nervous. And it's best just to let it go. That's what I do. I mean, I do watch it, but I mean, I look at it once every three months just to see how it's doing. But I never pull money out. During the 0809 crisis, I didn't pull any money out. I left it all in. That money, I had um, in one fund, I had $200,000. It went down to 100000 and it went back up to three hundred, All within about four years, four, four and a half years. It went from 200 down to 100 back up to 300 I, I could have been nervous and pulled it out at when it hit a hundred, and then I would have lost a lot. I would have lost two hundred thousand, right? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Other questions? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So consolidating loans means taking all your student loans from all the different sources that you have, and um, getting a uh, a one loan that. Um, and through a bank or through, I mean, it could be a lot of different ways, but um, it's probably not going to be as easy at the beginning because you don't have like a home to use, like get a home equity loan or something. So, um, but you can get a student loan that's consolidating everything and maybe at a lower interest rate if your credit score is like above 720. So let's assume your credit score is above 720. Let's assume you have three, lo three different loans from three different places. You go to a bank like Pentagon Federal Credit Union, by the way, that's a good one, penfed.com. Um, get, a, get, a, get an account there. Ask them to um, consolidate all your student loans. Your credit score is at 750, let's say. Uh, they give you a 
three and a half percent or four percent interest rate. You lowered your interest rate from say a seven percent down to three or four or five percent interest rate. You um, can pay off your debt faster and you have less interest to worry about. Well, I'm talking about any loans because you're going to have to start paying interest on your government loans within six months after you graduate. I believe it's six months. Is that right? Um, so, you know, you'll, you'll want to hold on to that one for six months because you're not paying any interest on that. Once you hit the six months, so then you want to consolidate if the interest rate that you can get at some place like a credit union is lower than what they're charging. So I don't know what they're charging right now because, I mean, it's changing. I, mean, I don't know. It's 5% now or what? Anybody know? 5% on government guaranteed loans, Stafford loans or any of those? Let's just say it's 6%. Uh, I think it's at least six, so you could probably get 4% if you had a good credit score. That's why it's really critical to have a good credit score. Getting a job, getting car insurance, or getting a lower rate on car insurance, and getting low interest rates for your mortgages, your car leases and loans, and your consolidated uh, student loan. That, that's why it's so important. Credit score is probably the one thing that you really need to focus on um, as far as finances goes. Well, the most important thing is to give, give it to God and give it up to God. Don't, don't, don't think it's all your money because it's not. It's God gave you the skills that you have, and you're earning money because God gave you those skills. So give it up to God. That's the first thing you need to remember. Well, there's like six different ways. So <clears throat> you can, um, if you have, let's say you have three credit cards, right? They, they base your credit score, one of the ways they base your credit score is on how long you've had that credit. So let's say that um, your maximum, if you get over nine years, average, you know, you've had that credit card, then your score is going to be the highest. If it, you've only had it five years, it's going to be a little lower. If you've only had it one year, it's going to be real low. So any any credit that any credit that you have that's like less than a year, you could get rid of that card. Actually, tell the company that you don't want it anymore and write a letter and say, please, you know, I withdraw my credit. You know, I don't want that credit card anymore. And um, then your credit score will go up because what your average um, length of time you've had credit goes up then. Okay, because you take out that lower part. So let's say you've had a credit card for six years. Well, then you want to keep that one on there but you want to take out anything, say, below under a year. That's one way. Um, actually, paying your bills on time is another way, making sure that you never are late even, you know, even a week. Well, it, actually, it has to be more than 30 days to really affect your credit score. But make sure you're never more than, you know, I, I've never been late on a, on, a, on a bill in my life. So never be late on a bill. Um, and then another way would be keeping the credit, the credit to the credit limit at a low percentage. So let's say that your credit limit on your all of your credit cards combined, uh, I don't advocate credit cards by any means, but let's just say that your credit limit on your credit cards was $20,000 on all your credit cards combined, and you're only using $500 of that. Okay, so you take $500 divided by the 20,000 credit limit, that's a percentage, and um, that's like 2.5% or something like that. So you know, two and a half percent is a really low number, so they're going to have give you a high credit score because you kept a low balance on your total credit limit. Okay, that's another way to do it. That's that's a real important way. Uh, some of them are weighted higher than others, so paying your debts on time is one of the highest weighted parts of your credit score. So I always tell people make sure you pay on time. The other two that I mentioned are are fairly high, but not quite as high. Yeah. Well, you need debt. You know, you need some debt, and I, yeah, okay. But credit card is one way, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. So, so every, so what I do, um, I have a credit card, and I use it for, um, it's, it's an, it's an American Express um, Delta Sky Miles card. That's the only card I've got, and um, I use whenever I charge anything, I use that card. And, and, you know, with Am, um, like Amazon and things like that, you kind of have to use a credit card. Right? I mean, there are, you can use a debit card, but um, you have to use a debit card or a credit card. So I just kind of use that and I accumulate miles and 
So that's one way. Other people really are, it's, credit cards are so dangerous you shouldn't even have a credit card. So just having a student loan, having an auto lease or loan is a way to build up your credit score. You don't have to have a credit card in order to build up your credit. You can just have a debit card and then have other loans. If you feel like you're, uh, you can't trust yourself with a credit card, then don't. Because you know yourself better than anyone. And you know that if you get a credit card, you're going to let the balance go over to the next month, then don't get a credit card. If you know you're going to pay it off every month, or let's say you think you're going to pay it off every month, and then you start to get in a bad habit of not doing that, then get rid of your credit card immediately. Don't let it get higher. Don't let the balance get higher. Get rid of that credit card immediately. One, one little trick was like, I heard that you know, somebody got uh, put a um, credit card that they didn't want to use it, because they didn't trust themselves in a um, pot of water or a bowl of water and then put it in a freezer and then in order to get the credit card out they had to actually defrost it and by the by that time maybe they prayed about it and they said hey I don't really need to go buy this thing whatever I was going to use the credit card for I thought that was kind of creative anyway to talk just a little bit louder I couldn't hear Right. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's a great idea, actually. Well, yeah, yeah, there, there are ways that you can, um, you, you can like put $500 down on a credit card and that's kind of like your line of credit. Um, then you get a $500 credit card limit. And then uh, if you didn't pay that credit card off, you got $500 sitting in the bank there that, that, that can be used to pay that credit card off. So there's no real threat there that you're going to get into trouble, right? So that's one way to do it. If you don't want a credit card, but you want to build up your credit score um, in, a, in a different way, that's a w one way to do it. The other way is just to make sure you, you know, have a low credit uh, limit so you don't tempt yourself. So maybe you have a thousand dollar credit limit. If they ask you what kind of a limit you want, just say, I don't want to, I want a low limit uh, so you don't tempt yourself. Another way to do it is just leave your credit card. This is really effective. Leave your credit card at home. You know, whenever you go out somewhere, just leave it in a drawer. Don't take it away. Don't put it in your wallet. Don't only have your debit card in your wallet, or only have cash or debit card in your wallet or check checkbook. Okay. But as far as a credit card goes, I would recommend that you get one that um, that uh, you shouldn't worry about the interest rate, for example, because you're never going to carry that balance over to the next month anyway if you're smart. So don't worry about that. Look for other things in a credit card that are appealing to you, like. For example, you get a 2% kickback for every purchase. You know, that might be important to you. Or maybe in my case, it builds up my air miles so I can fly my, my family to Colorado and London for free, which I did. Um, which, you know, that, that's, a, that's a pretty good perk, you know? So I, I don't know that um, I can give everyone the same advice. I think it just really depends on your needs as far as a credit card goes. And some people shouldn't even have a credit card. I shouldn't have had a credit card when I was younger, and I and I got rid of all my credit cards, and um, I I I decided that I would just have one credit card. I would leave it at home. Um, I would only use it for um, Amazon and stuff like that, and that's worked out better for me, because I don't think some people should even have credit cards in their wallet or even in their possession. And I think it's a dangerous. It's kind of like a car. There are some people that are really safe with a car. Other people speed and like do crazy things you know what I'm talking about if you're one of those people that does you know you're the speeder and that does the crazy things that's same thing with a credit card you could be really good with a credit card and not so good with a credit card okay other questions yeah yes yes Yes. Well, you could go to investopedia.com and learn a little bit about stocks and the stock market. I would recommend that, investopedia.com. 
And then I would also recommend, you ask me when, immediately, as soon as you get income. As soon as the income starts coming, you immediately start saving for retirement. Don't wait. Not even a month. You wait the first month. Uh, yeah, yeah, investing in stocks, yes. I, I agree with that. Right. Well, I mean, but it's better than zero, right? It's better than putting it in your drawer. Okay, all right. But if you have to save some money for an emergency fund, okay? And that money can't be in stocks. So if you're going to do that, or it can be a little bit in stocks, I suppose, but not too much of it in stocks. So if you uh, have an emergency fund, then the other choices would be, well, the choices are a CD, a certificate of deposit, which is a little bit higher interest rate. Um, you could do a money market fund, which has a little higher interest rate. You could do, um, you could do a, a treasury bill or a treasury bond, which has a, a higher interest rate, or a treasury note, which has a higher interest rate. So there are a lot of different ways you could get, you know, a little higher than our inflation or right at inflation, maybe just below inflation or just above inflation or close to it, uh, that don't involve the stock market. And that's probably where you should have an emergency fund, that you should have that money in that type of a fund. Yeah, yeah, you could use your bank, but I don't use my bank for my emergency fund. I, I use uh, a Scott Trade and I put it in a money market fund. So, you know, that depends on, for example, I, I think for me, um, I, I feel comfortable having some of my emergency fund in, in really safe stocks. Some people don't feel comfortable with that, I do. I have about half of my emergency fund in very safe stocks, okay? So Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble, McDonald's, Walmart, you know, those type of stocks. I, I have part of my emergency fund in that because that way, you know, if I look at my whole emergency fund, I'm getting about a 5 or 6% return, which is higher than inflation, because I have some stocks in there. If I didn't have those stocks in there, I'd, only, I'd get a return less than inflation. So I put a little stock, you know, do that to offset the low interest I get on the CDs and the uh, treasury bills and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a very good question, and I will answer that to the best of my ability. The, uh, the way I feel about it is that if you feel like your money is driving you, is causing you to, in other words, um, how, how attached are you to your money? So, so if you ask yourself this question, if all of my money left today, uh, what would happen to my life? You know, And if you can honestly answer, you can honestly answer that it won't change anything. Then the money is not that you know isn't 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 holding you captive. Um, if if you say I can't part with my money because it's too important to me. If you're not giving back to the church, if you're not giving any of your money away, you're not you know you're not giving to missions or whatever. Um, so you're 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 trying to keep all that money that God is. Has, has given you control over for the temporary period of time while you're on earth, if you can't part with any of that, then that probably tells me that your attitude towards money is that you, um, you're captive to that. You're kind of like that guy in the verse you were talking about. So I, my advice would be um, look at money as a way to help others as opposed to help yourself. And yes, you're going to help yourself because in order for you to help others, you're going to have to kind of, you're, you're going to do well. If you're going to build up that kind of wealth, you're going to do well yourself. But the question is, are you doing well so that you can build up your own wealth for your own physical needs, or are you doing it to help others and the church and those around you? So I think really there, that's a good question, but I think it really depends on the individual. Uh, so wealth is not a bad thing. It's kind of like the Internet. Internet can be a really, really bad thing or it can be a really great thing, right? And... Um, so it's just like the internet because wealth can be a very negative thing for people who are addicted to money and for people who um, 
love Christ, but want to, you know, they want to build up wealth to help others, those people are on the other end of the spectrum. So where you have to ask yourself the question, where are you in that, in that sort of spectrum of um, thinking about yourself or thinking about others? Okay? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think the verse is very good, but it's, it really doesn't say that money's bad. It just says that your love of money is bad. It can be a negative thing. Yeah. Other questions? Anybody else? Okay, so I'm going to put, I didn't do this, and I forgot to do this, but I'm going to put my email address up here in case anybody wants to ask me a question. Yeah. Okay, we'll find one good one. Oh, maybe not. Do we have one good marker? There we go. And my cell phone, if you want to text me and ask me a question. So text me a question or email me a question. Come into my office and meet with me in the second floor of the polling building in 213, all the way to the left on the very end there. If you want to meet with me, talk, to, talk about your investments or whatever, money any issues what we've discussed today.